as you prepare your testimony, think about these four questions and try to answer these in the course of your testimony. So, Andrew, let me just kind of ask you the questions, and you just share what's on your heart, how the Lord spoke to you, and how he's, how he's used you this week. So tell us something that you saw or experienced there that had a significant impact on you. wanted to have fun. They played together. We played with them. It was really fun. It was great. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and, and I know that had a significant, but she's got some mad volleyball skills, by the way. And <laughs> she got out there on the court and amazed us all with her skills. But describe an experience uh, where you saw the Spirit of God at work during your time there. Um, on our second day of home visits, we went to a house, uh, an older man and an older woman. They were both bedridden kind of one um, the older woman had to, her leg amputated because of diabetes and then the man had slipped and fell on ice earlier that year um, and the older man wouldn't even like he wouldn't look at us when we entered the house he wouldn't he covered his eyes he stayed in bed and then um, I don't know how we got on the subject of politics but he like went to town he was so angry he was he had something to say I didn't know what he said but uh, <laughs> So uh, Pastor Sam finally got a word in, and he uh, he was listening to Pastor Sam talk about Jesus and like whether or not they had uh, accepted Jesus in his heart, and he hadn't. And I don't think the older woman had either. So uh, Pastor Sam did the little prayer to accept Jesus in your heart, and uh, they both said it. Well, the older woman couldn't really talk, but at the end, like this man was just crying. He was like so like overwhelmed with joy and like uh, I think both me and Kayla like shook his hand at the end and he kissed our hands and like he was just glad it was great it's, it's amazing to see the spirit of God at work and just change in just an instant just there for a few minutes how he can just change hearts and change lives in just that very short span of time uh, what did God teach you about himself during your time in Moldova he works in mysterious ways like thinking about these people in their situations like I don't think I could handle what they go through every single day like it's hard I don't like imagining my kids like going out on a meal like that breaks my heart and so God doesn't give us more than we can handle I guess yeah, God's definitely good yeah we had some had some lessons to teach all of us on that trip that's for sure um, what is one thing that God revealed to you in your life that needs to change as a result of your time there? I was moved by literally everyone I met. Um, the people in the church were, they had such joy. Like they had mm. almost nothing in their hands. Like, but they were so joyful. And they praised God like no one was looking. And it just makes me think about like I need to focus on God. Mm. Well, praise God. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing. I know that was very difficult, and that was that was all you're very nervous, but thank you for sharing. That was wonderful. Praise God to hear what he did to you through that, through that time. And our next testimony, I can stay right here. Our next testimony, Renee Raffermo is going to come up and share his testimony as well. So, Renee, you come on. Renee shared his testimony at the youth service, by the way, too. And um, not the same testimony, shared his salvation testimony at the youth service, and that had a, a, a profound impact on those teenagers and then adam followed up with the gospel um so let me ask you the same four questions that i that i asked of angela tell us something you saw or experienced during that time that had a significant impact on you um so i i believe that was um the first uh, first day of home visit where uh, we were delivering um, food and um, we have met this uh, family um, um, the woman, uh, Hannah, was a mother of uh, four, and uh, she was expecting a, um, a fifth one. Uh, the husband had heard that we were going um, to visit them, and so he didn't want to 
had any part of it, so he had left home uh, during that, that visit. And um, we uh, just heard about that, uh, that woman. Uh, she was, um, you, can you could tell that she was uh, doing everything that she could every day to uh, try to provide for her kids. Um, and make sure that they were all well. Um, she, uh, I mean, they have barely anything, and she was able to ascribe the little money that uh, they're about to receive from the government to, um, I guess, get a, a milk, uh, milking cow, which will help them provide like milk and cheese. Um, but you know, she got pregnant, and um, there is nobody else that could take care of uh, the the cow, and so. Uh, what they ended up doing was um, cut the, uh, kill the, the, the cow and, and get a meal, the, the, the meat out of it uh, just because the, the husband, um, you know, is abusive. Um, he's using the money to um, gamble and, uh, and, drink, and drink it away. And so it was, it was um, uh, a lot of uh, members, uh, we are part of our team, uh, felt really touched and moved by uh, this this woman that was really trying to do everything that she could to um, uh, to ensure the you know the safety and, and, and caring for for her kids and 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 that was and, and to see that you know despite everything that was happening to life to their life uh, she was really um, I mean you could see even the kids uh, the the oldest like she was smiling um, um, while we were there the entire time. And uh, yeah, that, that really moved me up a lot. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a yeah, touching experience for all of us that had been there at that mm -hmm. home to see mm -hmm. to see how God was, was moving there. Yeah. Um, describe an experience that you saw or something that you saw that you, where you really saw the spirit of God at work. Um, there was definitely a lot of moments um, during this trip where I you know, could definitely felt God um, having an impact in people's life. Um, there was one lady uh, uh, in her 70s, um, bedridden for most of her life, um, for almost 20 years of her life. And uh, one thing that she said that uh, touched me was that she felt like she had uh, lived a life in such a way that uh, she could not be forgiven by God. And um, uh, Pastor Sam was uh, with us, and he was like, um, you know, you, sh you shouldn't think that way, because uh, God, as uh, Jesus Christ, has paid the, the, the price for our sin, but, you know, you, you could tell that she was beating herself up, saying that, you know, that there's no way, you know, he, he can forgive me, I, that I could be redeemed, and uh, and we, we started praying with her, and you could just see like the, the change in her heart at you know she felt she felt touch um, uh, when uh, she heard that you know uh, all you have to do is uh, um, repent and accept God as you know Jesus Christ as Savior and um, you know she, she she shed some tears and uh, uh, at the end she was just like uh, uh, so much more like joyful and, and, and smiling and praying with us that that, that, that was uh, an amazing uh, feeling. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what did God teach you about himself in that few months? Um, like Angela said, I think um, something that God uh, taught me is that he's faithful. Um, he will always be there for us um, as long as we, um, you know, turn ourselves to him. Um, that we ask him um, for our needs, to provide for our needs, and um, to, to just be, you know, to be, to, to pray. Because I, I think um, uh, being part of this mission group and um, seeing that we're able to help families that had tremendous uh, amount of needs, but also seeing the community involved uh, with what they have to work with and helping, um, those, those children, I mean, providing meals, uh, teaching them music and things like that. I mean, that's, 
you know, God's used um, so many peoples and ways to really um, touch uh, um, touch us and, and, and help us grow also. Um, in our faith. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about what God was teaching you, mm -hmm. what, what is one, one thing God revealed to you that needs to change in your life as a result of your time here? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that was the hardest question that I had to answer um, when, when you sent me this one. Um, yes, <laughs> I really had to think about this one, and uh, I think what it taught me, um, be more humble, and um, and as I'm saying that because I, I realize that you know we all have stories, um, and we tend to have this uh, portray this facade, or have this facade um, that you know we don't need anything or we have, um, um, you know, that we build to, uh, to make it true. But we all have a story and um, it may not always be a happy story, but I think uh, being humble um, allowed me to be more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And also, and, and, and in that way, um, really relate um, on a much more deeper level with other people and and connecting with them. Because, um, I mean, I saw some kids there during um, the youth service, or um, uh, we, are playing we, we were all playing volleyball together, but I saw them also um, play music, violins. I mean, like, it was unbelievable. But those kids come from family that are dysfunctional, and you would not, I mean, you would never um, to tell that that's where they come from and they have those problems every day because when we are with them, that's not why they, they were not complaining. They were not you know, saying that's how oh, this might, no, they were you know, having fun and sharing with us. And, um, and certainly try, being vulnerable to me uh, allowed me to know more about themselves mm. and you know, realizing that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's hurt um, and uh, to be able to reach out to them, um, I need to open my heart as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's, um, that was something uh, that um, was significant for me. Um, yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you for sharing, brother. Thank you for going on the, on the trip with us. Yeah. Thank you, brother. And then our third testimony this morning, last but not least, Sarah Owens, come on up and share. Sarah's got a little bit of a cough this morning, so she's coming up to share in spite of all of that. A little bit. It's one of those dry coughs. It's like a little out of, out of two nights now. Mm. You're going to speak up there. Yeah. Let me just let you know. Let me grab that one for a second. Yeah, it's, the gain is pretty high. <laughs> so uh, I'd wanted to go to Moldova for a while. I'd heard about it, and I'd seen people come back with their hearts filled and their tears flowing. And I understood that it was a very emotional experience, but I never understood the joy behind those tears. Um, I saw God work during a home visit during our second day. We touched very, and um, we were delivering firewood to an older family of four, I believe, an um, older couple with two daughters around 40s, I think, both of them were around that age, one of whom had, who had just lost her husband, his pancreas had burst in the night, and uh, so she was still in the birth grieving phase for sure. We were all standing around in this little living space, or little entryway area anyway, and uh, Pastor Barry was evangelizing, and, and the mother and father were speaking, uh, one of the daughters wasn't there, and but Lilia, the widow, was just standing there like this with her eyes on the floor. And um, so Barry was addressing the mother and father and when he came to address her after a little while, she just burst out crying and walked into the next living space. And, and one of the ladies from the church went to console her. And uh, at first they seemed 
you know, like, yeah, we're sinners, and yeah, we'll go to church on the holidays, hear one of their church stories. Uh, they seemed, you know, just kind of not interested in it at all. But once things started co- getting emotional, once Julia started crying, then the man got emotional, and he started talking about his health problems and how he just suffered a heart attack and how he has to go to the hospital a lot and have, like, extended stays. And um, things started to escalate, and I could really feel the tension and, and the need in that room for some kind of relief. And, um, and Barry kept on talking, and uh, eventually the daughter came back in. And uh, we were in the position where he was asking the, the Lord if he's doing anything and doing the prayer uh, that goes along with that. And um, and I just felt this overwhelming need to express my empathy to this woman directly, the widow, because I recently lost uh, a childhood or a youth friend. Uh, and I kept thinking about his wife. Uh, they didn't have any kids, and, and she's a widow, and she's just been grieving her heart out and with all of our friends and we've all come together to hug her and to give her love even from overseas and I was thinking this woman needed love and so I just walked up to her and I put my heart, my hand on my heart and my hand on her heart and I embraced her and we both started falling on each other's shoulders and then I stepped back and they wanted to be saved, they did the prayer to be saved she didn't. I think she was just too overwhelmed by grief. Um, but as we left, the woman followed us up, and she was, I mean, they were all just very, they were better. The energy was so much better. There was a release there, and I saw God work inside them, including the widow, too, I think, because she followed us out, too. And as I was getting in back into the van, I looked back at her and made eye contact with her, and I nodded to her, and she nodded back. And that was some, that's, that was some strong work of God, I believe. I felt there. Um, and the man, too, he was really bawling as well. I'd like everyone to pray for her, for Lilia. I think she's seen the path. She just has trouble walking right now because of her grief. And I agree with um, my other teammates. That community was amazing. I saw smiles every day. I saw smiles during the chopping, the loading, the hauling, the unloading. I saw teamwork, the cooks, the ministry leaders, Pastor John and his family. All of these people have created a thriving community of support for the adults and, and I agree mostly for the children. The youth and the children, they're amazing there. You would never, like Renee said, you'd never know that they come from such poverty. Um, They were so attentive and willing to participate. After I taught the first day, this one little boy comes running up. Um, God really taught me about service this time. Um, it's one thing to do a job. You know, I serve as military families. I feel so good about what I do because I can see their smiling faces. I do it for them. Um, you can volunteer to do a job, but it's different when you provide service for God with the love going out, God's love coming through you going out to others and then you feel God's love coming back to you through others whether they know it's God's love or not but it's, uh, we know it is it's the most rewarding feeling and I've always felt close to God but the service that I experienced has brought me closer to Christ I really um, 
I know now that I need to continue to, bu to build my relationship with Christ and that I have not <coughs> been as close to him as I need to be. Um, I need to build that relationship more than ever. Um, and that's what I need to change now. I just need to build that. Um, God is good. Let's serve him and serve each other. Thank you to the team that went, and and a, and a thank you if you were if you were here you were weren't able to go. Um, I know many uh, supported that ministry financially, uh, giving money to Firewood. Many supported that ministry and supported us while we were gone in prayer. And I want to thank you for being a part of what God did. Um, it's not a numbers game; we weren't keeping track of it for that reason. But it's good to kind of put our hands around eighty-seven souls that we know of. Mm. Just an amazing movement of God's spirit during that time. And, and the, the overwhelming sense of appreciation um, from that church to us. Many of, many of you have never met them and they've never met you. But they've got this overwhelming sense of appreciation. They kept giving us gifts. Little things to take home and little thank yous and mementos. And we're like, oh, it's not necessary. It's almost too much. And I, I was starting to think, do I have enough room in my suitcase to take this stuff home? But, but I, I, I thought about it from their perspective. Here are people that we have never met, and many of us never will meet them. But we were able, this church was reaching out and supporting them and doing things for them and sharing the love of Christ with them. Um, and that's just absolutely overwhelming to them. And I wanted to share, John, Pastor John gave us this. We'll hang this up in the Welcome Center right there, Certificate of Appreciation for the Church. Um, award is Aviano Baptist Church in recognition of the congregation's support of outdoor ministries by contributing to the Winter Firewood Project. Thank you for your partnership in sharing Christ, planting seeds in God's hearts, and bringing them hope and assurance that they will pass the winter in warmth. God bless. With gratitude for your devotion, John Groza, pastor of the Baptist Church in Kriana Vecchia Village. We'll put that out in the Welcome Center to be reminded of what God is continuing to do and continue to give. If you have been giving to that ministry, continue to do that. Um, we've, we sent them a whole truckload, several of them of firewood, but winter will come around next year. Um, and if you didn't get to go this past year, pray about if you're going to be part of that team next time. We're going to go again. So pray about if you're going to be a part of that team that will go um, next year. And so this morning, I want us to, to spend a few minutes. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, because I'm going to answer those same four questions that I asked the team members to answer. And I want to use this passage, Matthew chapter 20, Jesus' words, verses 26 to 28. I want to use that as the basis now, for how I answer those four questions, those same ones that the team members answered, it's good for you to see s pictures of mission trips. And we didn't have internet service in our home yesterday and today, so I wasn't able to pull the 5,000 pictures that Kayla took together. Um, I'm glad she took I take pictures of nothing, so I'm glad Kay Kayla was taking pictures, but I wasn't able to pull them together so you could see them. It's good to see pictures of the people there and the conditions there and the work that is done. That's a good thing. But far more powerful is to hear the stories of how God has been at work. And I want us to look here at this passage of Scripture this morning because I, I believe that what God is telling us, the overarching message from all of these testimonies, even from Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 20, is that every one of us are missionaries. Whether that is here or there in Moldova or anywhere, wherever you happen to be, that God's call for all of us is to be a missionary within the context that you're in. And so I want us to look at that passage, and I'll use that, as I said, as a basis as I answer the same four questions. Let me read the passage for you this morning. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 26. Or 26 to 28, I'm sorry. Jesus said, it's not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. For just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, as a ransom for many. First question I asked them was, tell about something that had a significant impact on you while you were there in Moldova. And you've heard the folks already talk about the, the attitude uh, that is within the people's hearts there. And that's what, what struck me the most. As we interacted with folks from that church and we interacted with people, the believers in that community, 
I couldn't help but to be impacted by the fact that this attitude that Jesus is talking about, I'm here to serve, not to be served, that attitude was real. That was on display right there in front of us. Many of the servants, the folks that are in the church, that are going out day after day, they're in the exact same situation as those people they're serving. Many of them are every bit as poor as the people they're going to visit and the people that they're serving. They have the exact same concern. Do, do, do me and my family have enough food to eat today? And what about tomorrow? They have those exact same concerns. There's this cold front coming down, and it's kind of hitting a little bit this morning. It's hitting, it's hitting there too. And they have the exact same concern. Do I have enough firewood for this week? And what about next week? And what about the week? They have those exact same concerns. And you've heard it said a number of times already, you would never know it to talk to them. They didn't talk about their problems. They didn't talk about what, what, who's going to pay attention to take care of me as they're delivering firewood. There was never a comment about, well, I need firewood too. They never said that. As they were delivering food boxes, there was never a thought to say, how come somebody's not bringing one to my home? You never would have known that these people had some of the same problems of, of the folks they were ministering to. There was this incredible sense of joy, this overwhelming sense of the fact that I get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah, I've got problems in my life. Yeah, I've got challenges too but I get to be the hands and feet of Christ to serve someone else. There was this amazing sense of joy in those folks. They weren't interested in being served. They were interested only in serving. I think what's interesting here in this passage is that this statement that Jesus makes, verses 26 to 28, it's in response to something. It's in response to a request on the part of the mother of James and John. She came in verse 20 and she asked Jesus, she said, Would you give my sons, James and John, the, the positions of prominence on your left and on your right? And this is part of Jesus' response. Seems to me that James and John were completely on board with mom's request. Because they don't, there's no, there's no record that they corrected her. Mom, be quiet, settle down, go get back in the crowd. There's no... No indication they corrected her. They were completely on board with that. And isn't that often our attitude? Notice me when I serve. Well, I'm going to serve, but what do I get out of this? And what do I get out of my relationship with God? Isn't that often what we're like, just like James and John? And Jesus' response to them was this. Listen, that's the way the, the Gentiles look at things, unbelievers. When they, when they get themselves into something, when they serve, when they give of themselves, what's in the back of their mind always is, what's in this for me? He said, listen, that's the way unbelievers do it. But it should not be that way with you, he said. That should not be the focus of believers. It's not notice me. It's not notice what I'm doing. It's notice him. Notice what he is doing. Don't bring glory to me. This is about bringing glory to God. What God honors is humble service for him. Service that is not interested in exalting us, but is very interested in exalting him. The word Jesus used there in verse 27, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. And that word is often translated in the New Testament as bond servant or bond slave. A bond servant was a, was a unique kind of slave. It was a, a servant that had served their mandatory period of service, maybe for a financial reason or some other reason they were in mandatory slavery. They had served that period, and when the period was over, they had been set free. They were released. But because of their great love for the master that they served, they voluntarily chose to stay in servanthood. With that master for the rest of their lives, they were called bond servants, bond slaves. That's the same word that Jesus uses. Talking about us, our attitude of service, solely because of our love for the Lord. Not out of a sense of obligation. Not out of a sense of what's in it for me or what am I going to get. That we voluntarily serve the master that we love. Jesus said, listen, I didn't come to be served. I 
the king of the universe, the God of all things, the sovereign one. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And those who love me will do what I did. They'll have that same attitude. That's what I saw in those folks in Krihanovic. This attitude among the believers that said, my problems are secondary. I have a chance to bring a cup of cool water in the name of Christ, and that's all that matters to me at this moment. They knew. They absolutely knew, and you could see it in their lives. They knew that Christ loved them far more than they loved him. And they knew that if I step out in faith, if I do what God has asked me to do, if I serve him solely out of my love for him, he'll take care of me. I don't need to worry about me. If I step out in faith, God will be there for me. I guess my question for us this morning is, do we have that kind of attitude? That servant's attitude. Not what do I get, but what can I give to the Lord? That's what makes us missionaries anywhere. That attitude, it begins in our hearts. Do we consider serving him as an obligation, drudgery, something I have to do? Or do we consider serving him something I get to do? I have the incredible privilege. And that was something that impacted me, was the, the attitude in these folks. This attitude that Jesus talked about was real in their lives. The second question I asked was, describe an experience you saw the Spirit of God at work. And Sarah already talked about this a little bit. As we went to Lilia's home and to talk with her and to talk with her parents, they had a lot of questions. That wasn't always the case in most of the homes. Most of the families stood there and they just listened. These parents had questions, lots of questions about sin, lots of questions about forgiveness. It was a great discussion we had with them. And as Lilia went off into the side room and was overcome with grief, her parents broke down and shared with us just their heart. We had an opportunity to, to just to weep with them and just to, to be with them. I asked if they wanted to know how they could spend forever in heaven with God, and they said that they did. But they couldn't get past this grief. We don't know how long ago Lilia's husband passed. It couldn't have been that long ago. They were still very raw. That was still right there on the surface. We found out later that this family usually doesn't open up. It's very unusual they said anything to us at all about their, about their situation, about their problems. The dad especially, tears flowing down his face, kept apologizing that he was crying. Just so overcome as, as the emotions moved. Luba Sarah mentioned the, the Moldovan lady from the church, Luba. She's one of the deacon's wives that went with us. She went and sat and cried with Lilia and wept with her. After a few minutes, I asked them if they knew for sure that they would go to heaven when they died. And they said, no, they didn't. And I said, well, would you like to? And Dad said this. He kind of indicated, pointed back to where Lilia was. He said, yeah, we're reminded that one day we'll die too. And I couldn't help but to think of that scene at the, the death of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, and the, the, overcome, the overcome with grief at the death of their brother. And what's interesting there in that scene in John chapter 11 is that Jesus purposely delays coming there. He waits on purpose, and he said, I'm glad I wasn't there, he said in verse 15 of John 11. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. See, it's not that God didn't know what was happening. It's not that he didn't know about the grief of Mary and Martha. But he knew he was at work in a much greater way. And he could use that situation not just to, to soothe the moment, but for eternal glory he was going to use that. There was a greater purpose. God was at work even in the midst of it. It was an amazing time. I couldn't help but to think about that moment when Jesus called Lazarus forth from the tomb and it said that many were there believed because of that God turned that grief that incredible sadness into a moment of eternal triumph as Sarah said I meant I asked this family if they wanted to know Christ and Mom and dad prayed a prayer of repentance. They trusted in Christ. We invited them to come to church that Wednesday evening. It was going to be a service at church. And mom and dad gave a bit of a 
I don't know, lukewarm commitment whether they would be there or not. Dad has some medical problems. He's not able to move around very well. Lily had returned to the room at this point. She just stood silently, seemingly disengaged to all what we were talking about. That Wednesday evening, we got to the service. We were all in different churches. Sam was at the church in Kriana Vecchia. I was in a church way down south. Adam was in a church about halfway in between. And after the service got done, I came back. We all came back to church in Kriana Vecchia. And I came into the sanctuary. Luba came up to me after the service. She said, she's here. Lily is here tonight. And she, she's over there. She pointed to this counseling room. She gave her life to Christ tonight. That was my reaction. Only the Spirit of God at work can turn that kind of devastating tragedy into an eternal triumph. It was an amazing And the Spirit of God is at work all around us, all the time. Jesus said, my Father is working up until now. And if we have a, a missionary attitude, we're waiting for those moments. We didn't make any of that happen. We just happened to be there. We have a missionary attitude. We're waiting for those moments so that when He moves, we're ready. Ready to be used of Him. Come to the question of what did God teach me? Or what did God teach me about him? I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun here. And I think there's something that you can't help but to take away from an experience like this, and that is that God has forgotten no one. He notices every person. There is no one on this earth that God has forgotten. And he desires salvation for us all, whether you're in the highest station in life, in the most powerful position the wealthiest person, or you're the most lowliest widow in one of these broken down homes in Krihanovecchi, Moldova. And God notices us all. He desires salvation, a relationship with all of us. Jesus said in verse 28, he gave his life as a ransom for many. Not just for some, not just for few. Only a few will accept it, but he gave his life as a ransom for many. He desires a relationship with every one of us. And he is utterly faithful to call us, to convict us, to enable us to understand his truth. And then, to enable us once we're saved to serve him. Think about that person that shared Christ with you. How you came to know your need of repentance, your need to be saved. And once we're saved, God wants to do that in us, wants to use us to be that person to someone else. He is so utterly faithful. There were so many, many people there that attended church every week, two to three times a week. They don't just come on Sunday morning. There's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, two to three times a week. Many of those folks were in church. And seeds were planted every single time. God started work in many of those lives long before we boarded the plane in Venice to head to Moldova. Those seeds had been planted, and we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. They planted and we watered, but God was causing that growth. That's what God reminded me about himself, that he is faithful. He is at work. He has not forgotten anyone. The last thing I want to mention very quickly, what did God teach me that I need to change as a result of this trip? I was deeply convicted during my time there of just how often... My own service and my own prayer life becomes about me. How often my prayer life is my list of things I want, rather than list of things I need. These wonderful, godly people in Moldova have nothing. And yet their focus is not about them. Their focus is on what they can do for other people. And I couldn't help but to be convicted in my own life and in the lives of American Christians, I think, in general. We have so much, and yet the focus even of our relationship with God is on us. What blessings is God going to give me? What is, what is God going to allow me to do? 
What is it that God is doing for me? I couldn't think of, help but to think about the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And Jesus said this to the church in Laodicea. I added this to my notes this morning, so I don't have the reference written in there. So I'll just have to read it out of the Bible. I guess that's all right. <laughs> this is what he said to the church in Laodicea. I know your deeds, that you're, you're neither cold nor hot, but I wish you were cold or hot. So you become lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth because you say... I think this describes the, the American church, the American attitude of Christianity. Because you say, I am rich, I am wealthy, I have need of nothing. But you don't know that you're wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I think we have forgotten, as American believers especially, and I was convicted of this in my own life, we have forgotten at times our desperate need for God. In everything, in every circumstance, we've allowed our wealth to blind us. The fact that we have so many things, we had a conversation with Pastor John about this. We're sitting around at lunch one day. We said it, it seems in ways that, that the people in Moldova, we don't have to convince them they have a spiritual need. They're reminded of need every day, of their physical needs. It's not that great a leap to their spiritual needs. We have a much harder time with Americans. We have everything. We're rich, but we've become blind to the reality of our desperate need for God. And I, and I couldn't help but to think I'm not alone. Only 10 to 20% of believers who come to church on a regular basis, tithe on a regular basis, give to the work of God on a regular basis. Only 10 to 25%. 30% of believers serve regularly. That means 70% come to church on a regular basis and would rather be served than served. 75% of Americans say they're Christians, but only about half of that attend church on a regular basis. Only half of that, only half of believers, less than half of believers, think it's important enough to even get up on Sunday morning and come and be a part of the family of God. This is the reality of American Christianity. It's nothing new. Jesus dealt with it in the first century. That we, we can so often allow our relationship with God to become all about me all about what I get out of it. We have to ask ourselves, what has become of our faith? What do we believe our faith is about? The commands of Scripture are, are pretty straightforward. He said, follow me. Be my witnesses. Make disciples. Serve the Lord with gladness. Bring your tithe to the storehouse. Do not forsake the assembling together. Commands of Scripture are pretty straightforward. We have to ask ourselves, what has become of my faith when the vast majority of Christians don't do those things? Is my faith now about me or is my faith about him? Dr. David Platt wrote a book called Radical several years ago, and the subtitle of that book is Taking Our Faith Back from the American Dream. What, have, what has become of our faith when we focus more on what I get out of my relationship with God rather than what I can do for him, what he can do through me. And we have to change our focus. This was the incredible conviction in my own life in those times to say I have to change my focus. It is not about me. It is about him. It is about serving others and bringing a cup of cool water in his name so that people notice him. And that begins with me. It's easy to say those Christians that are out there need to change that. But what about that Christian that stares back at me in the mirror every morning? That's where it needs to begin. American evangelist D.L. Moody said, if you want to see revival in the church, draw a circle around yourself and pray that God begins revival within that circle. Where does that begin? Right here, not with you, but with me. And the Lord challenged my heart to say, how much of my life and my service and my prayer life is focused on me? As we didn't create any of these missionary opportunities. And if we believe it when the word of God says that he is always at work around us, if we really believe that that is true, 
and we really take the Great Commission seriously, well, then we know that God's going to bring these two things together. He is at work around us and called us to make disciples, and he's going to bring those two things together to create opportunities every day for us to be missionaries. Now, the question for us is, are we ready? Whatever situations you're in, at work, at the gym, at the market, you're not there by accident. You're not here by accident. God brought you here and he put you in those situations. And on that specific shift you're on at work, God did all that on purpose. Are we looking for those missionary openings in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in? And I pray this morning that God would help you take the lessons that he taught us, the things he showed us while we were there, and see every opportunity for missions around you, and then follow him as he opens those doors. Follow him as he leads. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, what an incredible joy and a privilege it was to be a part of this team that went to Moldova. And what, a, what an incredible time of testimony and celebration and joy. We just heard about what you have done in us and what you have done in those wonderful people there. Father, your heart has convicted us this morning. You've reached down into each of our lives. And through some story, some aspect of what you have done in and through us in the country of Moldova, Lord, you have impacted all of us. Father, as we come to this time of invitation, Father, I pray that it, this would not just be a time where we say, wow, that, those are some sad stories. And we leave this place unchanged. Father, would you enable us, help us to use these next few moments as a, a time of repentance. For so often making our faith about us. For wanting to be served rather than to serve. For not looking for you at work and taking those opportunities. Father, would you help us to be repentant of that? change our hearts, Lord, that we would find ourselves to be missionaries here or Moldova or wherever it is that you've put us. Father, continue to move in these next few moments. If there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray these testimonies. That's how you change hearts, your word says, by the blood of the Lamb and the testimonies. Father, draw that person to you today. Would you continue to move in these next few moments? We pray in Jesus' name.